Welcome to The Old Numbers, the program where we honor the unsung heroes of bluegrass music. I'm your host, Jan Johansson. In today's episode, we're talking to Hal Poindexter, who, together with his brothers, Leon and Walter, and their brother-in-law, Herb Rice, formed the bluegrass band The Golden State Boys, early in 1961. I've been familiar with the name Hal Poindexter for a very long time. One area of our music that has fascinated me is the late 50s and early 60s bluegrass scene in the LA area. Actually, my early albums were mostly by California-based artists like the Kentucky Colonels, the Dillards, Country Gazette, and in particular, guitarist Clarence White. One of my favorite musicians, Tony Rice, grew up in L.A. from age four. The family moved to Southern California in 1954, which was also the year when Eric White moved his family from Lewiston, Maine to Los Angeles. I was an avid reader of whatever bluegrass publication were available. Liner notes, bluegrass unlimited magazines, frets magazines. In connection to these people, I would see the name Hal Poindexter mentioned and his band, the Golden State Boys. Back in the 1990s, I used to play in the Raleigh-based band, New Vintage. One number we did frequently in our stage performances was called Carolina Sweetheart. When introducing it to the people, Russell Johnson would always include the fact that it was written by a fellow North Carolinian by the name of Hal Poindexter. Around New Year's, I talked to my friend, Dobro legend Frank Poindexter, who is Hal's brother, and he informed me that Hal, now 86 years old, is in good shape and still has a very sharp mind. Within a few hours after our conversation, I was able to connect with this fine singer, songwriter, band leader, guitar player, entertainer, and storyteller. Hal Poindexter, a true gentleman who is definitely one of my unsung heroes. This is part of his story. This thing called I'm Ready.
already. I hymned for today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Golden State Boys Show. This is Hal Poindexter speaking on behalf of uh, Billy Baker, Dale McCurry, Skip Conover, and Eric White. Playing the- That's the Golden State Boys in the live recording from Cal's Corral at the Huntington Park Ballroom in the spring of 1964. This outstanding Southern California ensemble was formed early in 1961 and became quite well known throughout the area, primarily thanks to their association with Cal Worthington, the man behind the popular country music TV show Cal's Corral. By appearing regularly on Cal's Corral, they gained a lot of fans and followers. This attention meant publicity, which in turn gave the band access to more commercially beneficial venues where more unknown bluegrass acts typically wouldn't get booked. Before we go any further, let's find out a little more about the band leader, Hal Poindexter. The 86 years young Hal and I had a delightful conversation on the phones recently. In the Reedsville area? Yeah, and well, uh, it's a little place between Reedsville, North Carolina, and Danville, Virginia, called Ruffin. So my oh, wife yeah. and I was living at Ruffin, mm-hmm. and we moved to California in 1960. Many of Hal's relatives are well-known musicians. His brother Frank, he uh, lives in uh, Monroe, North Carolina, and he's a a mighty fine dobro player, currently playing with uh, Deeper Shade of Blue. And then we got the Rice Brothers, Tony, Larry, Ronnie, and Wyatt. And that's his nephews. And here, uh, Hal is talking a little bit about the Rice family and their dad, Herb Rice. Yeah, their daddy, Herb Rice, married my oldest sister, Louise. Okay. And when they was young and courting, when Herb would come to visit us, he would always bring his guitar and mandolin. Okay. And he would play and sing for us kids. And that's when I started loving that type of music. That would have been around 1946. I didn't play the guitar until I met Herb, and he would bring his guitar and mandolin in case somebody else could play the guitar. So I started le- uh, learning guitar in 1946, so I could play with Herb and he could play the mandolin, and, and that's how it turned out. We used to do some duets together. After about eight years of marriage, Herb and Louise and their two sons, Larry and Tony, relocated across the continent to the West Coast. According to Hal, the reason his sisters, Betty and Louise, and their respective husbands, Wesley Barrow and Herb Rice, ended up in Los Angeles was the area's multitude of work opportunities. Rural North Carolina was not offering much as far as good-paying jobs. Many families around the area earned a living from agriculture, tobacco, various crops, etc. Others were keeping their families fed by working in textile or cotton mills. On a personal note, My wife, Teresa, grew up on a tobacco farm in Moore County, North Carolina, and based on her accounts, I know how tough that kind of work was. The heat and humidity, the sticky tobacco plants, the spraying of toxic pesticides. It was normal to throw up after a day in the fields. Yeah, he he moves out there. He and the family moved out there in 1954 or 55. I, I believe it may have been 54. As far as his nephew's music, Hal was quite involved 
In this picture, he's sharing some mandolin insights with a very young Larry Rice. Uh, let's see. Tony had a band in the early 60s called the Haphazards. Yeah. Yeah, they created a little group called the Haphazards. And, you yeah. know, they were pretty good. Yeah. I and and they with... play, played a few places around, and <laughs> and to be young as they were, they were they were pretty good. Thank you very much. I'd like to take this, I'd like to take time out to uh, introduce our group now. Over on the guitars, Tony, and over on the banjos, Andy, and uh, my name's Larry. And back here on the big bass fiddle is Ronnie. And uh, speaking of Ronnie, right now we're going to feature him on a. Another instrumental. This one called Cripple Creek. group the haphazards in a live recording made in the afternoon of march 28 1964 at the second ucla folk festival the haphazards was a four-piece band consisting of hal's nephews larry tony and ronnie rice and banjo player andy evans the UCLA Folk Festival organization had created a youth section they called New Folks within the special concerts program that took place at Royce Hall, essentially a performance platform for the young and upcoming artists within the folk music genre. Another band featured that weekend was the Kentucky Colonels, formerly known as the Country Boys. Something a little different. This is another old fiddle tune. It's one called Listen to the Mockingbird.
moved around family members. In this case, the brothers Roland and Clarence White. 1964 was their second year to play the UCLA Folk Festival. They were friends with Hal as they had recorded some 45s with Hal back in 1962 when they were still using the name The Country Boys. That was uh, Carolina Sweetheart, Hal. Uh, that's one you wrote. It is. I wrote that, and uh, the, uh, the they were called the Country Boys when they helped me record that, but they later on changed the name to the Kentucky Colonels. Even if the Golden State Boys and the Kentucky Colonels sometimes played the same venues, there was one big difference. You know, we ended up playing more country and western clubs than the colonels uh, because of our connection with the uh, KCOP TV channel where we would do oh, yeah. two shows every week. And then the clubs started booking us in, but we did play the folk and bluegrass festivals. Yeah. Uh, but we, we, we sort of went in a different direction than the colonels. They pretty yeah. much took with the coffee houses and, and, uh, and places like that where they featured, uh, folk and bluegrass. Uh -huh. But we went sort of in a, in a, bigger direction, you know, in bigger clubs. <clears throat> yeah. Southern California was not exactly a mecca for bluegrass music back in the early 1960s. Hal illustrates just how rare bluegrass was by sharing the story about his nephew, Tony. Uh, any yeah. time, and especially in the early 60s there in in the L.A. area, it wasn't a 
like at Hot Bay. Blue grass was unheard of. Yeah. I remember one time uh, Tony took his guitar to school, and he played for his class. And oh. he didn't appreciate how it went over, and he come home and he, he told his mama. He said, "Bluegrass is the unknownest music I've ever heard of." <laughs> he said, "I never <laughs> taken my guitar back to school." Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Honey was real young, you know, about seven yeah. years old, and uh, and they couldn't get into clubs where we played, you know. But oh. we we would uh, do the same shows as the Colonels a lot of times. Yeah. So the, the Colonels was friend of ours. Clarence, uh, by the way. On that Carolina Sweetheart, the original recording, I played Clarence's guitar on that tune. So when you hear that, you hear in Tony's guitar. Yeah. I'll do. Uh, but but Clarence didn't play that lead till about, I'm going to say around 62. And I'll tell you what started him playing lead guitar yeah. is they booked Doc Watson at the Ash Grove and for a week and and Curtis would go there and watch Doc Watson play the guitar. Good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome once again to the Ash Grove. We'd like to start off this evening with Way downtown, just fooling around. They took me to the jail. Told me and it's all my No one to go, my bed. It is late last night when Willie came home. I heard him a rapping on the door. He's a slipping and a sliding with them new shoes on. Papa said, Willie, don't you rap no more. And then he started picking it up on his own. Yeah. And by by the end of 62, he was playing Clarence White guitar. Mm-hmm. He developed that style real mm-hmm. quick. But well, at first, when we went out there, he only played lead guitar. I mean, played rhythm guitar. No, so this was recorded when Roland was in West Germany uh, during the, his military service. So, who, right. who who did you get to play the mandolin? Uh, on my record, uh, Clarence played rhythm on the mandolin. Okay. He didn't take any breaks, but he chopped rhythm on the mandolin. Okay. But, but when they mixed it, they didn't have him up loud enough to hear him on the record. Uh, right. That's yeah. that's too bad.
those masters, I'm sure, are gone somewhere. Yeah, because it's been, you know, going on 60 years almost. A lot of people have tried to find uh, master tapes of the TV shows that we used to do. Yeah. And, and they've looked everywhere in the vaults of the uh, archives of KCOP television. Right. And, and they're, they're, none of them exist. They're all gone. Well, that's, you know, and a lot of times, <clears throat> I guess they just taped over, you know, used the they same. They did, uh, uh, the tape was real expensive, the kind that they used for TV, and yeah. they used it over and over. Yeah. yeah. And didn't save it. And they regretted that, like Cal Worthington and everybody involved in the show, because they would have had the opportunity to do reruns, you know. Yes. And oh, made yeah. money off of them, but he didn't yeah. keep them. Uh, so uh, please, please tell me about the the show you were involved in. Well, we were, we played uh, a show every Sunday, a live show mm -hmm. called Cow's Corral, and. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a 30-minute live show, and it went on. It started around 10 o'clock in the morning and ended around 2. Okay. So it was a long time and a lot of artists. We used to follow Buck Owens on our portion of the show. Buck Owens oh. was on there for a good while. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, well, he Bakersfield, but he okay. spent a lot of time in L.A., Oh. And after, you know, as he began to get a lot of hits, he got famous real fast, and, and he didn't do Cow's Corral anymore. He was mostly on the road mm -hmm. doing show dates and everything. Yeah. But all the country acts from Nashville from time to time would be on that show. Yeah. And then on Saturday... We would film a two-hour show at a at KCOP TV channel 13. And we want to do it for going to work tomorrow. Oh, I'm gonna leave this country. I'm going around this world. I'm going to leave this country for the sake of a little girl. Oh, I ain't gonna work to my love. Oh, I ain't gonna work. started in 1960. In the beginning, it was me and two of my brothers and Herb Rice. That, that was the main part of the band right there. Well, the banjo player, uh, my brother, he, he moved back east here 
And and from that point on, we had different ones in and out of the band. And and it was hard to keep a band together. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, because uh, cause back then, you know, it, if you didn't make a lot of money, it was hard to keep a band going. Oh, yeah. And we didn't make a lot of money in the beginning. Um, right. it, it was it was tough. Yeah. But we enjoyed playing, and, and, you know, we was breaking new ground. We was getting bluegrass in places where it had never been heard. Mm-hmm. Like, like Knott's Berry Farm, and we played Disneyland. And... And we was we was making progress in and getting bluegrass heard. Right. And finally right. it resulted in Flatten Scruggs coming out there on a tour and got this stuck covered by the man that started the Belleville Hillbillies. Oh yeah. At the Ash Grove. So and from that point on bluegrass began to grow in California. Yeah. So let me ask about the Ash Grove. It's it's like this um, legendary place. Oh yeah. Let's see. The original, I believe, was on Melrose Avenue. Okay. I don't remember the number, but I've heard that it it's changed locations. Yeah. Uh, I met somebody there that, that I never thought I'd meet in my life, and that was Mother Mabel Carter. Really? I met her backstage, and she was tuning her auto harp. And Mike Seeger was back there with us. Uh-huh. And we had a good time just chatting with him mm-hmm. as she tuned her auto harp. And I was surprised at how young she looked. Yeah. Going back oh. to 1927 when they made their first recording. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you very much. Y'all are real wonderful people. Thank you very much. I'd like to say howdy to all you nice folks. Glad to have every one of you. This is uh, my last night. I said a while ago, I said, it really don't seem like I've been here for three weeks. The time has really went by real fast. But I've enjoyed every minute of it. So I'd like to do another one of the old tunes here. This is one we recorded quite a few years ago called Diamonds in the Rough. Another place that was good about starting young careers for people, and that was the Troubadour. Okay. The Troubadour, we played there uh, several times. First time we played there, the Smothers Brothers had been appearing for a week. One of them, Tom, just died yesterday, I, I believe. I saw that. I saw that. Mm-hmm. We met some stars like before they got become big stars, like Roger Miller. Uh huh. He played yeah. the Troubadour the same time we did. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, he sang some of the very songs that made big hits later on, but it didn't go over too good that night. Like King of the Road, uh huh, and Dang Me, yeah, this and uh, hit. it's and later on, you know, they turn out to be big hits. 
Yeah. Well, he had been on uh, the country music time uh, a couple of times, and and he was trying to make it, you know, and and he wasn't getting a lot of attention until finally King of the Road was recorded, and it was a mega hit, you know, and. And from that point on, people started paying attention to him, and he became a big star. Yeah. The same way with Glenn Campbell. Uh, we played a, a festival one time. I believe it was in Pasadena at a place called the Ice House. And they had a folk and bluegrass uh, festival one weekend. And... Uh, uh, when I got there, a dish jockey asked me would I do him a favor. I said, yeah, what is it? He said, will you play rhythm guitar for a guy that's going to play here tonight? His name is Jim Campbell. He said, I think he's going to be a big star one day. <laughs> he, mm. he, said, he said, by the way, I need your bass player, too. If you and a bass player could play rhythm for him. So we did. And wow. I later found out that even at that time, Glenn Campbell was one of the most sought after uh, studio musicians in, in, in the LA. He was on everybody's records playing yes. different instruments and things. Yeah, I mean, I mean that guy was full of talent. One of Hal's favorite performers at the Ash Grove was a fellow North Carolinian from Deep Gap in Watauga County. An artist who is known and loved all over the globe, Doc Watson. Yeah, when Doc Watson played at Ash Grove, I would go every time. And I remember one time they was lucky enough to have Bill Monroe and Doc Watson the same week and the owner of the place, Ed Pearl, I believe was his name. Yeah. He would get them to perform, uh, perform together. Yeah. And they've done some good stuff. What is the first number that we got picked out? Oh, well, we got a good old romp stomping good one right here. It's uh, one that you and Charlie put on a record a long time ago called Peace Here Tonight. <laughs> Get me a briar and I'll twist it in his hand. That's the way I'll get him my nose. I know. Yes, I know. I know. I surely know. That's the way I'll get him my nose. I'll get me a briar and I'll twist it in his hand. That's the way I'll get him my nose. Look out, my Fill me a fire and I'll cook that old hair. Roll him in the plate and make him brown, good and brown. Have a feast here tonight while the moon's shining bright. I find myself a place to lie down. 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 Find myself a place to lie down. Have a feast here tonight while the moon is shining bright. Find myself a place to lie down. Make it pretty now.
These two artists were already legends when they played the Ash Girl the first time. Doc Watson and Bill Monroe packed the house and many of LA's bluegrass elite were there. Clarence White was a big fan of Doc's powerful playing, so one could assume that, if all possible, he would have attended the event that evening. I don't remember Clarence being there, but he probably was. That place was small, and it was packed with so many people. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could miss somebody. Yeah. You know, but I went there a lot I, and met people that I never had met, like the Stanley Brothers. It's with a great deal of pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, that we present the Stanley Brothers and the Clinch Mountain Boys. You know, the Monroe sound, since we're on that subject, I'd like to mention a couple things here. Uh, I know a lot of you have never heard where the Monroe sound really come from, and you've never been there. Well, I have. Uh, Monroe brothers were born and raised in a little cabin down in Rosine, Kentucky, near Beaver Dam. I've been there and spent some time there. Uh, Charlie Monroe was never very well known too far out this way. Uh, they separated, Bill and Charlie split up before, you know, they really broke out all over the country. And Charlie Monroe himself is a wonderful singer. I don't know how many of you have heard him, but he's one of the best. Uh, not only is Bill a good singer, but his brother Charlie is one of the unsung heroes or something like that, in my opinion, what I would call it. Anyhow, what I'm trying to say is I'd like to do a number, Ralph, if you remember this one, that Charlie and Bill done years ago, back on Bluebird Records, back in the early 30s. They started singing up in Hammond, Indiana, and then moved down into the Carolinas, where they made a terrific <coughs> hit. And the houses wouldn't hold the people that them boys had. This is called Drifting Too Far From The Shore, and uh, if you want to call this a copy, I hope it is a copy. I hope we can do it as well as they did back then. Uh, I don't know of any other way to do this song. Did any of you ever hear that record, Drifting Too Far From The Shore, you have? Let's try to do it. Let's get it off this way. Out on the perilous day Where danger silently creep And storms so violently sweet You're drifting Now, about the peak of our career, you wouldn't think so, but in May of 1964, we got the opportunity to tour with Marty Robbins. Oh, and, okay. And we opened the show uh, in the Midwest. We done about nine dates. And Marty Robbins was, was a big star back in those days. Sure. Sure. I mean, they didn't get no bigger than Marty Robbins. So oh. there was a pleasure working with him. He oh. had been living in California, and he watched some of the TV shows. He was not on many of them because they couldn't afford him. Okay. Uh, but anyway, he was familiar with our band. Mm -hmm. And the, the man that done the booking for us was friends with Marty Robbins' booking agent. Oh, okay. So they got together and asked Marty Robbins would he uh, mind if if we opened the show for him on, on a tour in the Midwest, and he said that would be fine. He would enjoy that. So that's yeah. how that turned out. Wow, that's a big gig. Yeah, yeah. I'm not aware of any audio from the tour the uh, Golden State Boys did with 
Marty Robbins in May of 1964. However, there are some surviving live recordings from around the same time of the band that spring. The following segment is from KCOP TV's weekly country music special, Cal's Corral. The program was aired from the Huntington Park Ballroom located on the second floor of the Bank of America building at 6130 Pacific Boulevard in Huntington Park, California. Here's Hal and the Golden State Boys doing their rendition of Pain in My Heart, written by Larry Richardson and Bobby Osborne. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Bluegrass uh, portion of Cal's Corral. Well, the Golden State Boys will be around 30 minutes uh, entertaining your Bluegrass style. And uh, we'll get things right underway here with a song today for uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cal Worthington. This is... uh And then uh-huh. Dale McCurry, Dale McCurry played banjo. Yeah, Dale, Dale played the banjo, and uh, Billy Baker played the fiddle. Yep. And uh, then the Dobra player, of course, is Skip Conover. Yeah, he passed away a few years ago. Yeah. He. In fact, it's... everybody. Uh, that was in the mainstay of the band has passed away except me. Yeah. Don Palmley, the banjo player, he passed away. Yeah. Ron mm-hmm. Goss passed away years ago. But yeah. his brother Rex died at 45 years old yeah. uh, at the hospital. He was he, having a problem with his heart. 
and he was waiting between tests, and it just gave out on him at oh. 45 years old. Oh, yeah. And, and her Bryce, he, he, he passed away years ago. Yeah. Dale McCoury is still in good health. Yep. And I think yeah. Billy Baker is. Okay. He's kin to Kenny Baker. He's Bill good. Monroe's fiddle player for a long time. I I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Because, it, uh, did, have you ever heard of a fiddle called Scotty Stoneman? Oh, yeah. One of my heroes. Yeah. Uh, I've played with him a few times. Man, he was one of a kind, wasn't he? One night, we was all at my brother-in-law's house, Herb Bryce, and uh, just him, he come by and come in and brought his fiddle, and we jammed for a while there at Herb's yeah. house. Yeah, that that whole family, you know, was into music in a big way. Come from a yeah. place called Freeze, Virginia. That's near Galax, Virginia. Yeah. It, it freezes in the winter and fries in the summer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, a lot of I want to tell like, you about how we got that name, the Golden State Boys. Uh, yeah. I, when I moved to California in 1960, uh, we had one son, uh, and he was a year old. But anyway, once I got there, me and Herb started playing right away because we used to play back in the early 50s, just me and him. So the boys seemed to take an interest in that. Tony would sit close to me and watch me play the guitar. And uh, wow. and we said, now, what are we going to call ourselves? And we threw a few names around, and my sister was looking at the table. And there was a quarter, Golden State Milk. She said, how about the Golden State Boys? And it stuck. So it come off of a, a container of milk set on the table, Golden State mm. Milk. Oh, that's a wonderful story. Where did you all get the, your material from? I. It looks like you did a lot of the, well, I guess, the, the popular pieces at the time, like Salty we Dog. We did, Blues. but uh, the Frat and Scruggs were big fans of all of us. So if, yeah. if we've probably done more Frat and Scruggs stuff than, yep. than anybody else. Exactly. I mean, I can see you did, on this show, you have you have uh, 29 songs, and you got Salty Dog Blues, I'll Go Step Into, Pike County Breakdown. Yeah. Uh, Doing My Time. Yeah. Yeah. But and they're all fun, fun tunes to play, fun songs to play. If I Should Wander Back Tonight. Yeah. So, we done a show one time for a college, and Hugh Cherry was a disc jockey at, at KFO, KFOX in Long Beach. And he wanted to do a, a lesson in bluegrass, he called it. So we played the college, uh, Cerritos College, I believe it was. And, and he, and he was like a historian on that type of music. Mm-hmm. He would go into depth about explaining how the song come about and who wrote it. I believe it was El Camino College now, that'll think about it for a minute. Yeah, it was El Camino College and Hugh Cherry and the Golden State Boys and his lesson in bluegrass. He had a late night uh, show, so he's, at first he was the only DJ that would play bluegrass. That's how we become friends with him. We would stop by the station sometimes and jam a little bit and yeah. have, you know, played on the radio. Would you be loving another man?
how did you get him hooked up with Dell? Um, Bill Monroe made a tour to California around 60, first part of 1960, I guess. I mean, 1964. And Dale McCurry was playing guitar and singing lead for Bill. Well, I found out he played the banjo, too. Uh So we told him if he ever decided to come back to California, we'd like to have him to join our band. So after they got back to back east, in a few weeks he called and wanted to know if we could uh, have an opening in the band for him playing banjo. Yeah. And we told him, yeah, and he said, there's a fiddle player that wants to come with me. Could you work him in? And we said, yes. <laughs> we was playing uh, Cow's Corral and and getting what bookings we could get. But, you know, it was hard for a six-piece band or even a five-piece band to survive on. So... It just wasn't enough money in it for them to stay at it. So yeah. by mid-1964, they moved back east. Yeah, okay. And I think Dale took a job uh, in the logging business for a while. Mm, okay. Yeah, and it's a struggle to make enough money for a six-piece band. Oh, man, tell me about it. Uh, some of us had regular jobs, you know, and and a, and a few didn't, but they didn't have a very good living either. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's the same now. It's a struggle for musicians always. Yeah. So on this on this uh, show also, and you maybe you could help me date this because I have no idea uh, what exact year this was recorded, but. You got uh, Eric White on the bass, and and the two uh, uh, Dell and Billy Baker, and then Roland sitting in. It would have been in 1964. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, were you ever involved with Joe Mathis? Yeah. Uh-huh, I knew Joe real well. Okay. In fact, uh, uh, he was on country music time with us every Saturday night. He, Joe and Rose, his wife, they would do numbers together. Mm. And then sometimes Joe Mathis would, would start playing different instruments and and have people to hand him like a banjo, then a fiddle, then a mandolin, then a banjo, and he'd play them all. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we knew Joe real well. All the boys in the Poindexter family played music. How come y'all ended up doing that? I asked Al. Well, my uncle on my mother's side was the only one that played guitar any kind of music. So uh, he would visit us often because we lived in walking distance and he would bring his guitar down to the house just about Mm -hmm. every night and play for us. And we all took a liking to it. Yeah. And then when Herb come along, Herb Rice, we liked his kind of music too. So we, all of the boys learned to play guitar. Yeah. And one so of my brothers did, was a good banjo player, Walter Ray. What about her? When did you first meet him? <clears throat> in 1946. 1946. My sister worked in Danville, and and her, she worked at a, at a at something like a dime store, variety store. People used to call them dime stores. Okay. And she met Herb. He worked at a hardware store across the street. And that okay. would have been in 1946 in Danville, Virginia. Yeah. 
that's where Tony was born. And Larry, too, yeah. Larry was a good musician. He's good sure man is there. And he could sing good, and he wrote good songs. Yeah. Yeah, he... Larry was a, was a good kid. Real, real talented. He's, uh -huh. all those boys spent a lot of time with me and my wife. Tell me about your uncle. Uh, uncle Joe? Uncle Joe, that's right. Well, now, the musical influence on Poindexter's side would, would have came from Uncle Joe Strader, mom's brother, and yeah. also it would have come from Herb Rice. Between Herb Rice and Joe Strader, uh, my uncle, that's how we got the music in our genes, so to speak. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you saw Herb? The first time I saw Herb was the first time I can recall seeing him is back when, just before they left and moved to California. I mean, I was a, just a kid. Because, yeah. you know, Larry, Larry was born the same year I was, 1949. Okay. He and was born uh, at the Danville Memorial. Right, yeah. So he would have been about five years old when they went to California, I guess, and that's how old I would have been because yeah. I, I'm only two months older than Larry. And Tony is really uh, three years older. I mean. Yep, that's right. It would have been two years difference. So um, he would have been like uh, three years old, I guess. Yeah. I, I'm not good <laughs> at, at, at dates at all. Uh, I, I, I could look it up, you know, if it was very, very important to look it up. But uh, and I would have access to it. But just it, talking on the fly, I, my memory is horrible. <laughs> it's crazy. Herb was a good tenor singer. Mm hmm. He was a good tennis singer. He had a voice like some people with a lot of range. You know, he could either sing bass or sing tenor. You've seen people like that. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, you
to replace we went through a lot of Taylor singers till finally we got Vern Gostin yeah and Vern sung Taylor until we could get Rex his brother out there and <laughs> then we went we, once we got Rex me and Vern would alternate on lead and, and baritone somehow our band seemed to inspire a lot of young pickers to go ahead and 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 make it big once they've been in our band, like like Dale McCure, Vern Gosden, Rex Gosden, yeah. Don Palmer, Skip yeah. Conover. Skip plays yeah. with a fiddle player, Bur, by, by, by and Burline. Oh yeah, for a long time. Well, you Skip know, played yeah, with my... him and. Uh, but a lot of people that was in our band went on, uh, like Don Palmer, and made a career out of it, you know? Yeah. Him and, and David and a guy named yeah. Randy Graham. He he lives in right in, in, in this area, and he's a good friend. Uh, mm-hmm. Randy is. He's a yeah. fine singer and musician. Yeah. I knew him before he could play a lick. <laughs> okay. He, he just he just decided he wanted to learn to play, and he, and he didn't take him long. And I had sung on bluegrass, and all of a sudden he was as good as anybody you'd want. Well, he he's one of the best tenor singers ever. Yeah, I know he was. You know, the Cardinals did. Uh, there is the fountain. Back in the probably in nineteen ninety, I mean seventy seven or something like that, on, mm-hmm. on the first album, just killing it, and and that's really before, at least uh, before Doyle Lawson recorded any uh, a cappella gospel. Doyle Lawson claims that he's the first one that ever done it, but yeah. also Don Farley. He said he was the first one to ever do it. <laughs> so you don't know who to believe on that. Our fiddle player was a left-hand fiddle player. His name was Bobby Sloan. Oh, yeah. He wasn't what you call, you know, a great fiddle player. But nevertheless, because he played left-hand, he could sell it better than anybody I've ever seen. Yeah. I mean, people love to hear him play. No, oh. and he's a fine bass player. Yeah, he finished out his playing career with J.D. Crow. Oh yeah, he he played with J.D. for a long time, and and you know J.D. he was a stickler for yeah. rhythm, and you know he. Well, he you know, I was a, Bobby called me. He had been with J.D. for a while. I'd say six months or a year. And he called me one time, and he said, Al, we need a tenor singer. And he said, somebody that can sing tenor and play the mandolin. And he said, you know anybody like that? I said, I do. And he's not doing anything now either. He said, who? I said, Larry Rice. Uh. They give him a call, and Larry was down there in two days. And and he started with them, and you know they made one of the best albums I've ever heard, a gospel album on a Limco label. It was Doyle, J.D., and Larry doing the singing. Mm-hmm. Is it a mo- model church? Yes, yeah, that's it. That's it. No. And, and it's some mighty fine singing on that album. I mean, Doyle is one more talented guy. As far as singing goes... Tony Rice turned out to be one of the best singers in bluegrass. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He can sing Sweet Sunny South, and it makes cold chills on my arms. Amen. You know, I I remember years, even 11 years ago, I, I was listening to that song, 
and and it, it, I was in tears because it, it just touched my soul. Yeah. I mean, Tony, he he just and you know he didn't sing a lick at first. He wouldn't sing for nothing, and all of a sudden he come out singing, and man, he oh. was good. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, I'm going to slip this in on Tony while he's uh, getting a little drink of water there. I'd like to acknowledge a VIP out there in the crowd uh, visiting with us today. And I uh, stress a very important person because she's the mother of the dynamic duo here, Tony and Wyatt, Mrs. Louise Rice. I know you're there. No, she's there. We got t-shirts left and records left. Yes, uh, we do have a uh, few t-shirts. Yeah, just save me a copy of Cold on the Shoulder and yes. Backwater, because yes, I haven't I... seen either one of them in about two years. Yes, <laughs> we'll do this tune here for Billy Brister, I think it is, in the state of Mississippi. It's an old grass tune called the Nine Pound Hammer. <laughs> It really is mind-boggling when you start listening to Hal's eyewitness accounts where he is mentioning so many names of musicians and other people involved in the industry and the way they are connected, you know, both in time and space. 
I became interested in these kind of historical links when I used to jam with this elderly gentleman back in the mid-80s at Clyde Franklin's store, the Bluegrass Center in Asheville, North Carolina. When this gentleman was a kid, he had befriended the singing brakeman, Jimmy Rogers, who was playing at the Battery Park Hotel in that fair city. Now that's pretty incredible. I used to know somebody who had been a personal friend of the first artist to ever record what's known as country music, Jimmy Rogers. In the case of Hal, well, he knew all those influential musicians when they were still in their in the formative years of their youth. Players who by now over 60 years later are true legends. Hal is a link to an era, the early 60s and the spread of bluegrass in Southern California. He's one of the most important and impactful bluegrass artists in that region. The Golden State Boys was similar to Monroe, Jimmy Martin, J.D. Crow, or Dole Lawson in that it was much like a high-level bluegrass school where many well-known profiles got their basic training. I'm very thankful to Hal and Frank Poindexter for making this video possible. you have enjoyed this episode of the old numbers the arena where we pay tribute to the unsung heroes of bluegrass music 